Good morning. This is Pastor Don from St. John of the United Church of Christ in Troy, Ohio. Next Sunday is our first in-person worship service in a long time. In fact, today's sermon is number 42. We are so looking forward to it and would just love to have you join us if you can. But if you can't, we'll be putting the entire service on Facebook Live at this same time each Sunday. We have a number of prayer concerns. Maybe you've been following following them. Uh, Jean's hip fracture uh, and Nancy has had her first chemo treatment. We have heard from her and she got through it well. Lloyd and Craig both have had serious surgeries are in need of recovery and Joyce's family member uh, died in not too long ago. This is just a partial list as always and so we really encourage you to keep praying for the people that you know about that need your support. And many thanks too to Mike and Jenny, Colleen and Sarah for their fine work over these past many weeks to bring you these Facebook videos during the pandemic time. That's been a good thing for us as a community when we couldn't be together in person. Uh, what an amazing job they've done and I certainly wanted them to know that I appreciate it. According to the Gospel writer John, it was at the beginning of what we now call Holy Week when some people of Greek descent came to the disciples and they just said they wanted to see Jesus. And I don't know what was on their mind. The writer never really tells us, but it quickly became clear what was on Jesus' mind when he said to those people that came to him, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Maybe those Greeks were considering becoming followers of Jesus. I don't know. But I'm not sure that an advertising agency would have recommended the response that Jesus gave as a way of building up the brand. In effect, Jesus was saying to those inquirers, you need to know that if you want to experience new life and productive life at its fullest, you'll be called to die a little or a lot before you experience life. Death before life. We're not accustomed to that sort of a message. What are we to make of that twisted order of things? What I understand is this. If we take the business of following Jesus at all seriously, we will find that it's not all white lilies and new ties. It isn't just an Easter new life. It's also about death. The real message of Jesus will get us into trouble. It did Jesus, and we cannot expect less for us. If it isn't a physical death we have to experience, it's another death that is just as dark and painful, perhaps. The resurrection has no meaning at all if we don't know something about death. The fact is that Jesus said, if we don't know death, we will never get to experience life at its fruitful or productive best. Death is intimately involved in being fruitful. Every seed knows that. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If we don't want to undercut the power of the resurrection, then we likewise must not undercut the necessity and the severity of the deaths that preceded. You say that looks and sounds kind of bleak. Well, yes, of course it does. If you think of it, if you can't imagine it from the seed's perspective as it's dropped into that dark hole in the ground, from that point of view, there is no assurance of resurrection and new life. Only death and loss and hopelessness are in the view 
of the seed. It's only the farmer that knows better, not the seed. We all don't always know better, but the farmer always does. The farmer knows that productiveness depends on this death experience. The death for us can be our own death or a loved one's physical death, of course, but it can also be the death of a dream. It can be the interruption of a major illness, a critical reversal in your life, a rejection, the loss of a love, or a pandemic, or a thousand possible things. For Jesus, there were three years of building on a dream, of bringing the reign of the, his Father into the world, into a world of people who suffered under the iron fist of the Roman domination. Three years of bringing hope to the sick and to the demon-possessed and the outcast and the hope of many years beyond that. And now, just when it seemed like his message was catching on, he was looking squarely at those crossed beams being assembled for him. And like a seed about to be dropped into the ground, all he could see was darkness and loss and hopelessness. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I don't know how much Jesus knew, and I don't know how much his heavenly Father had shared with him, but this I know, Jesus knew what loss looks like, and he knew what it felt like. This was no imagined thing for him, no game he was playing where he was play-acting for three days and three nights. This was loss, as real as any of yours or mine. And no wonder they said about his prayer in the garden before his death that he produced drops of sweat that were like drops of blood. So, when you stand by the graveside of one you love, you're not alone. And when you feel like you're burying an, an unfulfilled dream that you knew you were called to do, you aren't the only one that felt that. When you experience what it feels to you like a final roadblock on a path that felt so right, there is one who's been there and been there before you and walks with you. When the illness moves in and sets up a barrier to your hopes, your leader and your mentor understands. That's when you're called to walk into the dark with only these words, only this promise. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Let's pray. Gentle God, we don't understand how death has such a role in new life, but it seems to have been built into the universe, and we know that you have been there before us. Show us the path to life, I ask in the name of Jesus. If you would like a copy of today's sermon, just send a note to the church office and include your name and your address, and we'll be happy to return your uh, mail with a copy of the sermon. Thanks for being here.